If this bill shall pass, the institutions of the character required by the people and by our native land would spring into life and not languish from poverty, doubt, or neglect. They would prove the perennial nurseries of patriotism, thrift, and liberal information. Places where men do not decay, they would turn out men for solid use and not drones. The graduates would know how to sustain American institutions with American vigor. Shall we not have schools to teach men the way to feed, clothe, and enlighten the great brotherhood of man? Pass this measure and we shall have done something to enable the farmer to raise two blades of grass instead of one, something for every owner of land, something for all who desire to own land, something for cheap scientific education, something for every man who loves intelligence and not ignorance, and something to increase the loveliness of the American landscape. Those words were spoken 150 years ago by then U.S. Representative Justin Morrill of Vermont. He was trying to convince his fellow lawmakers to pass an act which would become the backbone of the American system of public higher education as we know it today. Under the Morrill Act, the land-grant colleges that were either established or strengthened were given two mandates. The first was to make sure that higher education was accessible to all students. The second was to make sure that they conducted research and outreach that was beneficial to the citizens and the economy of the state. Good evening and welcome to this special edition of Wyoming Signatures. Abraham Lincoln did indeed sign the Morrill Act in 1862 and as a result the University of Wyoming was established. In fact, 125 years ago this month the first classes were held here in this building called Old Main. Well, it was the only building on campus back then. So tonight we explore the land-grant mission and celebrate the fact that it's alive and flourishing in our state today. We start with President Buchanan, he describes how the university is connected to those it serves. The act uh, was created 25 years before we opened our doors and from the very start uh, we were a land-grant institution with a commitment not only to the traditional areas of study but also uh, to the, I think the uh, legislation called it the mechanic arts, we call it engineering and agriculture, uh, but what that really did was connect uh, the university to the people, uh, to things we now call or areas we now call economic development, but it made us relevant and connected to the state in a way that permeates everything we do and everything we pay attention to today. Um, and it, uh, it isn't really possible to talk about how it affects us because it's who we are. It's uh, in the blood of the university. Why is the land-grant mission relevant to all citizens of Wyoming and not just in terms of getting a degree? Because we have a role not only to educate young people but also to make sure that the work we do, the research we conduct, uh, reaches out to the folks and communities around Wyoming uh, and has relevance to them and helps them uh, in their day-to-day -day jobs and in their environment. Uh, the agricultural experiment stations, uh, obviously uh, an easy example to point to. Cooperative extension, another one. Uh, we operate the state vet lab uh, in an agreement with the state. Um, we have the biosafety lab where we study all sorts of wildlife and livestock disease uh, to try and understand better uh, transmissions between those two animal populations, uh, treatments, vaccinations, uh, control. Um, it is uh, dead center in the heart of our College of Agriculture uh, and it is of uh, critical importance to uh, to our livestock industry in this state, which really goes, goes back as far in history as Wyoming goes back. Uh, and it is also critical to wildlife management, which is uh, certainly part of who we are. We take our arts out all over the state to small towns and uh, small communities and elementary schools and junior high schools uh, to perform, to uh, show them, not just talk about, but to show them 
uh, theater and dance and concerts and performances. Um, and we love to do that and our students love to do that. And um, what happens over time is this, the students that come here are in fact the students that we connected with when they were younger uh, and they were the audience uh, in those small towns and small communities. Imagine 20 years from now, what will the land grant mission look like here? I think it will look much the same at its core because I think what the land grant mission does in a, in a big global way is it connects this university to this state and the people in the state. And I don't think that's going to change. I think that's who we are. It's embedded deeply in our mission and in our sense of purpose and it permeates uh, the campus and all of our facilities and our faculty as they work and develop their careers here. Um, I think over time uh, areas of emphasis, uh, particular uh, research uh, directions will vary as, uh, as they become uh, more or less relevant to the challenges facing Wyoming at the time. So while we may spend a lot of time studying brucellosis uh, today, and we may do that for a number of years, uh, we certainly hope the day comes when that's not the challenge we need to focus on anymore. Uh, and there are new challenges that we'll uh, redirect our attention to. So it allows our, um, our daily emphases to change in relation to the needs of the people of Wyoming and the jobs and the businesses and the workforce uh, that we need to populate our industries and our businesses. Um, but I think uh, at our core, um, we began as a land grant, we will continue as a land grant, uh, and it is who we are. President Buchanan, thank you. Well, thank you. The Morrill Act became law during what was perhaps the darkest days of American history. It was the middle of the Civil War. The South had seceded, and it passed primarily because the legislators from the South did not vote. For more historical context, we turn now to Phil Roberts, Associate Professor of History at the University of Wyoming. Why the opposition to the Morrill Act? In many parts of the country, particularly in the, in the South, but elsewhere, the uh, higher education had been a, something for the elites and it really wasn't designed for common people. And uh, the colleges and universities had been formed by either wealthy philanthropists or by church denominations, or in some cases funded by states. But here was a case where Lincoln and Justin Morrill both believed that uh, education should be much more broadly accessible to Americans, and it shouldn't be just for those wealthy elites, but it should be accessible to, uh, to middle-class people, working people, and, uh, and there should be an effort on the part of the nation to uh, try to encourage work in agriculture, in uh, uh, education, in agriculture, and education in, in engineering, or the mechanical arts, as it was stated in the bill. Uh, how was it implemented here in Wyoming? At first, it was designed only for the states, and it was, of course, designed only for those states that were still in the Union. And so, therefore, the Confederate states were not included, obviously, but uh, the territories were not included either. And so, even when Wyoming became a territory in 1868, Wyoming didn't have an opportunity to uh, apply for Morrill Act funding because, frankly, the Act didn't, uh, didn't contemplate that territories would need anything like higher education. So it took uh, the work of a, actually a Wyoming territorial governor, a fellow by the name of John Hoyt, to get uh, the Congress to recognize that maybe there was some merit in allowing for land-grant universities in the territories. Why, uh, uh, Hoyt argued, why should people be, be penalized by not being able to have access to higher education 
simply because they're residents of a territory. Why can't we expand the Morrill Act to include territories? And so while he was territorial governor of Wyoming from 1878 to 1882, he lobbied Congress and with the help of other territorial governors, got the Congress to authorize an act uh, allowing for territories to participate in the Morrill Act. And it's kind of interesting to note that uh, many of the universities in the West stem from uh, the 1880s. They were founded in the 1880s prior to the, uh, the statehood of places like Montana and Utah and, and, and Wyoming and the Dakotas. And uh, the reason those came into existence in the 1880s is because they had the opportunity for that federal help from the Morrill Act that had been uh, made accessible because of that expansion. Sure. So what did it look like when they started to put this land grant into place? Wyoming got uh, a typical uh, uh, land grant. Uh, that's why it's called land grant universities or the Morrill Act uh, 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 universities. Uh, the uh, federal government was awash in land in those days. And so in order to foster education in the states and in the territories, the theory was that we give to each state a parcel of land and the proceeds from that land would go toward the upkeep, maintenance, and even creation of these land-grant universities. And in the case of most places, they would get uh, 30,000 acres of federal land for every representative that they would have in Congress. So, so you have two U.S. Senators and you have a, a member of Congress, you'd get 90,000 acres. Well, in the case of the territories, of course, the territories didn't have U.S. Senators and uh, only had delegates to, to the House of Representatives that weren't voting members. And so the way the legislation was designed for places like Wyoming and Montana and other places was a maximum of 100,000 acres could be handed over and from that 100,000 acres those territories could uh, then either create or maintain a, uh, a land-grant university. A lot of the reason for the establishment of a university was uh, the fact that we would get that land-grant from the federal government. As, as John Hoyt, the territorial governor, who later became the first president of the University of Wyoming, once stated, he doubted that there would have been universities in any states in the West had it not been for this impetus from the federal government, this uh, impetus in the form of these land grants. So as Hoyt's ideas for higher education uh, took hold, uh, he uh, was not only the president of the university, but he was also a delegate to the, to the Constitutional Convention in Wyoming. And so he is a, a important person responsible for the education article in the Wyoming Constitution where there's that really interesting line that says tuition shall be as nearly free as possible and uh, and he meant by that that the legislature should also take responsibility for higher education and and uh, properly take care of the university not only should it have to rely on federal land grants, but there should be some state appropriations that are, are making sure that students are able to afford to go. The oil money that came from the land grant sections became very important to the university in the 1920s because at that time the uh, drought had taken hold in Wyoming and agriculture was in terrible shape and uh, tax revenues were way down and yet the university was in desperate need of a new library, a new gym, new classroom buildings. And so consequently, there was money coming in from the oil royalties from the university section that uh, could be utilized to build the, the university library that's now the Ava Nelson building and the Half Acre Gym. And this was at a time when universities around the West were strapped for money and here was UW able to build two uh, what were at the time state-of-the-art 
institutions, a library and a gymnasium that were both state-of-the-art. Two important programs started later in time, the agricultural experiment stations and cooperative extension. How did that factor into the Morrill Act? Both the mechanical part, that is the engineering school, and the ag school were the main recipients of Morrill Act money. And uh, as time passed, uh, Congress realized that uh, these programs were being quite successful and uh, universities and uh, agricultural groups petitioned for uh, additional revenues to try to provide outreach to farmers in various states. And so Congress passed an, an additional act that created uh, cooperative extension. Of course, there were also experiment stations established around Wyoming. And so with a combination of those county agents in each county and those experiment stations in various parts of the state, it did a lot to assist agriculture, uh, particularly in the early part of the 20th century. As Dr. Roberts just mentioned, the land-grant uh, colleges and universities were set up by the Morrill Act and they were followed on by acts that set up the extension and service and the experiment stations. And the goal of these uh, uh, services are primarily to link the university's classrooms, students, and research effort with the people of the state in order to serve those people. For example, the University of Wyoming has an extension office in every county and on the Wind River Reservation. And the extension service provides uh, uh, education and programs related to 4-H youth development, uh, agriculture production, uh, natural resources and the environment related to range science uh, and nutrition as well as community development. Uh, so, so this is a way to link the expertise of the university with the needs of the people and obviously vice versa to find out for the university what the people need. The experiment stations work very closely with the extension service. As research applied needs come in, that the public needs, um, if that research information is not available, the experiment stations uh, can do that research and provide that to the public. Next, you're going to hear from uh, Mr. Joel Bowsman. Uh, uh, Mr. Bowsman is in a unique position to be able to uh, visit with you about uh, the university's link and services, uh, given he's a county commissioner uh, as well as an agriculture producer. In addition, he and at least one of his children are alums of the university and the college, so they have that student experience as well. I think in terms of the big picture of, of why the land-grant university and the extension capability that goes along with that uh, has a, in the big picture, it has a big impact on the custom and culture of the counties at the local level, as well as the economic viability of, of production agriculture in the state. Throughout the country, the universities land-grant universities, uh, you know, that's been partly of what they're about. And so it would, it would leave a huge hole if we didn't have that capability through the universities. Uh, my name is Joel Bowsman. I'm a fourth generation rancher in Sublet County, and I've been engaged in the livestock business all my life. And this ranching operation is, is my wife and I and, and both of our adult sons and their families. So. At this time, we have three generations working on the ranch uh, with my, me, uh, my sons, and my grandchildren. I first got involved with, with the University of Wyoming when I got out of high school. I went to the University of Wyoming for four years, uh, majored in ag economics, and uh, I became somewhat aware during that time that there were a lot of things that you could learn in college that you could take home to the ranch. I worked for the university, uh, worked for the Animal Science Division, and uh, developed a working relationship with, with the professors and the staff uh, beyond just being a student at the university. And uh, that ultimately led to an invitation to be on the uh, Ag Extension Advisory Board. So I served on that committee for several years, and I became during that time probably more aware of the function of university extension than I, than I knew up till then. And then through the years as we needed help, uh, we always, I always knew there's a resource there that, 
if I need expertise in some area, they may not have it, but they can darn sure help point me in the way to get it. Uh, we had a, a specific issue on our forest allotment, uh, Silver Creek grazing allotment. I was one of eight permittees. It's a big common allotment and we all run together up there and, and we were in a, a, call it a disagreement with the Forest Service about the impact that our cattle were having on the resource, uh, specifically impact to stream banks. I didn't agree that the impact was necessarily coming from the livestock. So my first step was pick up the phone, call the extension agent and say, hey, we got, we got something going here, is there any help available, any technical help in the range department at the University of Wyoming. That ultimately led to the range staff at the university working with our extension agent, helping the permittees put together a cooperative joint monitoring program, working with the permittees, the Forest Service, Game and Fish, NRCS, we even had BLM involved, uh, without having the technical skill to determine what's causing something to occur in a stream. Uh, you look at the sediment, you see a cow off grazing to the side and they put two and two together and say, well, if, if it's these cows got to be the cause of the problem. And the result of all that monitoring uh, proved that it was not our present day operations that were causing that. That help from the University of Wyoming started an effort that we later expanded it was picked up on by other states in the country, permittees uh, took that information back home. If we had not been able to come up with a process that would truly, based on sound science, measure the impact, uh, we were, I guess I would use the word politically, at the mercy of the federal agency. And, and the end result of that, uh, you know, who knows what it could have been, but we were, we were fearful that it was going to result in a cutting our permits uh, and to the point that we may no longer be economically viable. When we first started this conversation about rangeland monitoring, uh, the university range department, they were a professional third party that got us together, we were at an impasse with the Forest Service. The reason the university can be effective at that is they're a credible source of information. Uh, they, they have the expertise in range management that, that is looked at by, recognized by both the federal agencies and the permittees as being non-biased and, you know, based on the best available science. Having extension personnel local increases tremendously their availability and as well as the awareness that they're there. Uh, if, if, if they weren't out in the field, many of us would not know that capability even existed because we don't have that same day-to-day -day relationship with people living in Laramie, Wyoming, for example, that we do in our local extension office. They become a part of the community uh, their kids go to the same schools that our kids go to, and we come to realize, you know, what their capability is, why they're there, and so they're much more likely to be called on as a resource. I learned a lot working with the university. I've come to realize the value of folks that, even if you may have disagreements, you get together, you look on the ground, and you come to a solution. And that has never failed to result in success in my experience. If we did not have that capability from the University of Wyoming, and, and a lot of what they offer today in terms of outreach, I don't know where else that would be available. And if you take that into account, if if that wasn't there, the custom and culture of our communities would not be what it is today. And I can use, uh, for example, as an example, 
we would have lost in our case because we're so dependent on public lands grazing. Uh, we wouldn't be ranching today. Uh, this land would be used for some other use uh, besides production agriculture. It's been a, a lifelong goal throughout not only my generation, but it, it's very important in many lifelong ranch families to be able to turn over that ranch to the next generation. Uh, a lot of family history involved in these ranches. Uh, from the time my great-grandfather settled in this area uh, and was the first person to file on land. Uh, so we can trace some of our family history clear back before Wyoming was a state. And so that, that becomes an important part of family history and, and uh, the custom and culture of production agriculture and, and not only here but all over the state of Wyoming is, is very important to a lot of multi-generation ranch families. So it's been important to us to be able to manage our production, our, our livestock operation, to where we are in a position when the time comes to turn the range over to the next generation. In the beginning, land-grant colleges focused on agriculture and engineering, but as times changed, so did the university. For example, our need for more health care providers meant that the university joined a consortium called WAMI so that Wyoming students could go to medical school and then they could come back here and practice. And did you know that close to 30% of the student population never comes to campus? Nope, instead they learn where they live and work. They can go to video conferencing centers in their hometown or they could stay at home and watch lectures that are streamed on the internet. Those are just two examples of how the Morrill Act has been modernized. And if you're watching this, you too have been touched by the land-grant mission. For everyone at UWTV and the Outreach School and the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources at the University of Wyoming, I'm Mary Young saying goodbye and thanks for watching.